Heavenly Father, I just pray now that as I bring your word from Daniel, that you will just be with me. And I pray that it be your words that I speak. Just fill me to overflowing with your spirit so I can share this precious word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So that's Daniel chapter 4. Now I wasn't going to do the full chapter, but when I got... I do my sermons by the amount of words, so I know roughly where I am. But as I was getting near, I thought, well, we're into enough for another sermon out of this, so I just carried on that bit farther. So if I go on a bit, you'll just have to put it away, it's all right. Okay? Won't be too long, you know, we're not talking hours. <laughs> anyway, so it's Daniel chapter 4. <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, mighty his wonders, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Now here we have a king of a pagan nation, ruler of the known world, and one who has ultimate power over all the nations of the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar has witnessed the Most High God at work in this world and protecting those who are faithful to him. Nebuchadnezzar saw with his own eyes three men thrown into a burning fiery furnace. I love saying that, sorry about that. Uh, he saw a fourth Join them, who was like the Son of God. He witnessed their exit from the fire without even the smell of fire upon them. And this leads us to this quite unique chapter, which is a te testimony of how a Gentile king of immense power can have a change of heart and recognise recognises Yahweh as the Most High God. If you need a good example of what a witness witnesses, look at this chapter. Nebuchadnezzar relates to what he saw and experienced to others. The perfect example of a good witness. The king was in the perfect position to spread the truth about the Most High God. No one could stop this going out because on the, her on the earth there was no one greater than the king. Nebuchadnezzar shows us today that if you are a Christian in a position of fame and power, you should speak out. There are Christians around the world who do this. I've just recently watched uh, an interview with an actor called Kevin Sorbo. I don't know whether you know him or not. Played in Hercules and Andromeda on the telly. He's been in loads of films. He was famous, made plenty of films, involving two long running series on the telly. But he started to speak out about Hollywood and his faith. Now eventually, Hollywood threw him out, as they do. That was about 10 years ago. Since then, he has been in Christian films like God's Not Dead, 
quite a lot of others. He's now become a, a spokesperson and filmmaker, speaking up for Christian values. Of course, these people already have an audience, they are, and Yahweh will use them to further his kingdom. But you say, how does that relate to us? We might not have a big audience that listens to us, but we have those people around us to speak out to. If we all did this, our voices would be as big as those in power and to our fame. We're all part of the body of Christ. So whether we have a loud voice or a small voice, we all have a part to play. It was good to declare his experiences of what Yahweh had done for them. Signs and wonders are powerful things in getting people's attention. Just imagine if we at this church start to praying for people they get he to get healed and everyone did. Word would soon get around and this church would be full. And I'd love to see this church full. But for the right reasons. That they are here to worship Yahweh. Not to see only miracles. Now Satan is very interested in keeping us quiet. But when it came to the king of, Babylon, the, of the Babylonian Empire, there was no queen keeping him quiet. And in verse 3 it says this, How great are his signs, mighty his wonders. His kingdom is, is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar was not holding back. He wasn't thinking, I don't want to upset people. He wanted the truth to get out there. And we are called to do the same. Yes, people will get upset when you speak the truth of the gospel. But that sorts out the goats from the sheep. The kingdom of Yahweh will always divide people. Always it upset people. So don't worry about it. Just speak the truth. And let the spirit do his work. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of a great kingdom. But realised that Yahweh's kingdom was far greater. And will last forever <coughs> and ever. Now we must understand where Nebuchadnezzar stood with regards to Yahweh. Yes, he had acknowledged that Yahweh was the God of gods. That he was the most powerful of all the gods. But he did not accept Yahweh as the only God. He still believed in other gods. So verses 4 to 9. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in my bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans and the astrologers came in. And I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last Daniel came in before me. He, who was now named Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, 
because I know that the spirit of the Holy God is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. Now you picture Nebuchadnezzar. He's happy. He's relaxed. Everything's going well. He felt really at ease in his palace. I don't know whether they had day beds, but he'd have been relaxing on, say, a day bed. Not a care in the world. Nice place to be. Life doesn't get much better than this type of moment. Then he starts to let his mind wander. Then Yahweh puts his vision into his mind. And not for the first time, he was disturbed by his vision. He became afraid, it says. I'm glad when I have the occasional dream or vision in that half sleep state in the morning. That's when he seems to do it to me. I'm not afraid. Maybe the difference is I know where it has come from. Nebuchadnezzar didn't realise it was the Most High God who was speaking to him. This is not the same dream as in Daniel 2. It's a completely new one. So Nebuchadnezzar, he made a decree that all the wise men should gather to him and give him an interpretation. Now this time Daniel was included in this group. But for some reason, he didn't get there until a little later. Now this time, he was quite willing to tell them the dream. Again, they could not make it known to the king. Notice the wording here, could not make it known. You see, there's a big difference when you say could not. The dream was not difficult to interpret, especially to men who dealt with things like this. I personally think that the insight was not the problem, but courage was the problem of the wise men. But they could not make it known to me, its interpretation. It didn't say that they didn't understand the dream. It says that they could not make it known for some reason. Maybe I'm, I'm reading between the lines here, but I get the impression that maybe they wanted to sort it themselves before, before they included Daniel in the occasion, equation. It says, at last Daniel came before me. He was relieved to see Daniel because he knew Daniel was in touch with the holy gods. He who was named Belshazzar after the name of my God, he says. I get the impression that Nebuchadnezzar was making a point here. Bel was his God, but he respected the God of Daniel. There was a big difference between acknowledging the God of the Hebrews and accepting him as your own God. The God of the Bible is the only true God. You deviate from that and you're making up your own God. Contrary to popular belief, always do not lead to Yahweh. So here we see Nebuchadnezzar showing great respect to Yahweh and wanting to hear his advice. But that is as far as it goes. He wasn't willing, willing to accept him as Lord and Saviour over his life. He wasn't willing to surrender to his teachings and let Yahweh mould him. People these days, as I'm sure you're all well aware, are willing to acknowledge Jesus as a nice man or even the Son of God. 
But that's as far as it goes in their lives. They think Jesus should adapt to them and their ways. When the opposite is actually the truth. We should change to be more like Christ. And that can only happen when you surrender yourself to him. Difficult task, but we need to surrender to him. I've known people who pick and choose from all the different religions and come up with something that suits them. Sorry, that's not the way. Take your way. Rethink your life because that way is on the broad path, not the narrow path. Verse 10. The visions of my head as I lay in my bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. It le its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the fields found shade under it and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches and all the flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in my bed and behold a watcher, a holy one come down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. And let him mind... Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. The visions of his head as he lay in his bed started off well. There was an enormous tree growing in the midst of the, of the earth. So big, it was able to see from the four corners of the earth. This tree was so plentiful of fruit and shade for animals and birds. It was there for the whole earth. It gives a picture of provision and security. That this tree of, or what it represents would bring these things about. Our thoughts would be today that this was Yahweh on how he protects and provides for his children on the earth. But here, in the context of the dream, it represents a ruler on the earth. Welcome, we'll come back to that when we get to the interpretation. So here, we see this wonderful tree it most probably was very impressive to see the, in this vision. When a watcher came down from heaven, he was presumably an angel, but he doesn't say. The watcher was to proclaim the fate of the tree. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter the fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Wow. That's a bit unexpected. The tree was in its prime. It was so big and strong, you would think nothing could have touched it. But when it was chopped down, it was stripped of all its beauty. 
All its leaves and branches were to be stripped, stripped off, and all its fruits were to be scattered. So from being big and strong, it was reduced to nothing. So in 15 and 16, we, see, we get a, a bit of a strange twist. It says, leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze. Why would you bind up a tree? You support trees when they're old, but not bind them up. Was this for the tree's protection, or was it to restrain the tree? Now we must remember that the tree represents Nebuchadnezzar. It will all become clear when Daniel gets involved. It goes on to say, amid the tender grass of the field, let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Does it make sense? It sounds a bit like he's going to be in the fields with the animals. How on earth can this be? A man living with the beasts in the fields? In fact, a man acting like the beasts of the fields. It must have really perplexed Nebuchadnezzar. Because from his perspective, he couldn't see what was being shown to him. And you get the impression he definitely think, didn't think it was his future. So 17, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. The sentence itself says a lot. There's been a sentence passed on Nebuchadnezzar by the Holy Ones. This one sentence says it all, all his power and position. He can't stop it. I've got a quote now from Wood. It says, like most kings, ancient and modern, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be, believe, that he ruled instead of God or anyone else. Both the Assyrians and the Babylonian kings thought of themselves as rulers over all the earth. So describing themselves in their inscriptions, and that's wood. This quote describes where the king's thoughts were coming from. He thought he was the ultimate power on earth and nothing could overrule him. But the sentence of the king was to show the people who was really in charge. Who truly ruled, ruled over all the earth. Now reading through this, it wasn't that hard to interpret the dream. No wonder the wise men of Babylon were reluctant to give him the right interpretation. This didn't tickle the ears of the king, and they were afraid. Verse 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Now Daniel, who the king knows, will give him an interpretation and the correct one. He turns to Daniel, and unlike all the other wise men, he was not afraid to tell the king what he wanted to know. However, bad the news was. He knew Daniel was filled with the spirit of the Holy God 
And the king did not yield himself to Yahweh, and that was the problem. 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those you hate, who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. Daniel obviously hesitated for a while. You might be thinking Daniel was afraid to tell him the answer, but Daniel was, was the king's friend. So Daniel was dismayed, not afraid. He knew that what was going to happen to his friend, and it wasn't nice. The king could see Daniel was troubled by the dream. So he spoke kindly to Daniel and, and said, don't let the interpretation alarm you. Go on, speak the truth. You get the impression the king knew it was not good news by this stage. And he wanted to encourage his friend. My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you. And it's interpretation for your enemies. You don't need to be a rocket, science, rocket scientist to know that from that statement, it was going to be bad news. 20 to 23. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached to heaven, it was visible to the ends of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under the beasts, which under which beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reached to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, come down from heaven and say, and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but the leaves believe the stump of its root in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field, let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven periods have passed over him. So Daniel goes over the dream again. But in verse 22, he says, It is you, O king. Daniel goes straight to the point and tells the king, He is the tree. Of course, he would bring this message in love. He applied it very humbly, as all messages brought in love should be. This was similar to what the prophet Nathan said to King David. He said, you are the man, in 2 Samuel 12, 7. 24 to 26. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the root, roots in the, of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you, for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Clark says this, great men and princes are often represented in the language of the prophets under the similitude of trees. You'll find that in quite a few places. 
Now Daniel makes it clear where the decree came from. And that was Yahweh. He also makes it clear on whom the decree was to affect. So the interpretation goes like this in verse 25. That you shall be driven from among men and your dwellings, your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. When I was reading through this, <clears throat> one of them I put oxo rather than ox. So as it's going through, I thought, wow. <laughs> Basically, the king will be driven into the fields and live with beasts of the field fields and even eat the grass like the ox how this would come about i'm not sure i'm, I'm sure nebuchadnezzar was not very well he was puzzled about he knew it would come about because he trusted daniel's words now if there was any good news about this whole situation it was that it would only last for seven periods of time not seven years until he recognized that the most high god was ruler of all things and who had given him the throne in the first place the thing is the king could have avoided all this happening to him if he only humbled himself before Yahweh and accepted the fact what as powerful people often do they can't change their way of thinking so Yahweh would have to do it for him let that be a lesson to us when God's trying to teach us something accept it or else he will we'll make sure you, get, <laughs> you learn the lesson so therefore in 27 therefore O king let my counsel be acceptable to you break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a, a lengthening of your prosperity so there's that word therefore you keeps cropping up because of what has been said by Daniel now listen to what I have to say he says Daniel knows a solution to the king's problem and first lets him know he, he's going to give the king counsel break off your sins he says by practicing righteousness what we call I suppose repent of your ways the answer to most things in the kingdom of Yahweh turn away from the life you lead and live a righteous life yes Nebuchadnezzar has had a judgment passed on him by Yahweh but there was a way out for the king remember Nineveh when Jonah went there he preached to them in chapter 3 of Jonah and they humbly repented Nebuchadnezzar was in this exact same position unfortunately the king did not repent he was so proud and self-centered that he couldn't bring himself to be humble before Yahweh Nebuchadnezzar was not only counseled to stop sinning but also to practice righteousness and generosity well, 28 to 33 all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon and the king answered and said isn't it, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power 
as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, for seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled. Against Nebuchadnezzar he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagles, feathers, and his nails were like birds' claws. So why did Yahweh leave it 12 months before carrying out his judgment on the king? Yahweh always gives people time to repent. And that applies to us as well as kings. Nebuchadnezzar probably had forgot about his original dream, but Yahweh had not. So there was the king walking on the walls of Babylon, feeling all puffed up and proud of his, of his achievements. Babylon was truly one of the most impressive cities of the ancient world, which also included the famous Hanging Gardens, all built by Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, this has only been recently confirmed by archaeologists taking them that long to prove it 31 to 32 while the words were still in the king's mouth hmm. I get a picture of Yahweh looking at Nebuchadnezzar as he walked and praised him I'm thinking okay you've had your time to repent there is no chance of you repenting so judgment will now fall on you. Notice that the king was still talking when Yahweh spoke to him. Yahweh reminds him of what was said and who was really in charge. Now the, quest, the big question is, did Nebuchadnezzar turn into an ox? Or... Was it a mental illness? There is actually a form of insanity in which men think of themselves as animals and imitate the behaviour of an animal. Its name is Insania zoanthropocica. Yeah, I'm sure that's wrong. And more specifically, in Nebuchadnezzar's case, boanthropy, the delusion that one is an ox. Dr. Raymond Harrison in Britain in 1946 had a patient suffering from boanthropy. Of course, with Yahweh, all things are possible. So I'll let you make your own mind up about that. So a quote by Wood, again, says there is no corresponding record of this seven year period of insanity in the secular historical records of Babylon. Exactly as you would expect, really. Considering the custom of the time, nevertheless, Abidinius, a Greek historian, wrote in 268 BC that Nebuchadnezzar was possessed by some god mm. and that he immediately disappeared. So only a little bit of evidence there but 
It gives us hope. Some dismiss this account of Nebuchadnezzar's madness as unhistorical. But there is no historical records of his governmental activity between 582 BC and 575 BC. Ooh, seven years. The silence is deafening, especially when we keep in mind how the Near Eastern leaders like the egotistically trumpet their own achievements and hide their embarrassments. So even though there is no direct proof this happened, there are glimpses of possible evidence that something went on at that time. So 34 to 37. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him what have you done at the same time my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom my majesty and splendor returned to me my counselors and my lord sought me and i was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of Heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in, walk in pride he is able to humble. Quite a statement, isn't it, that? Nebuchadnezzar could not bring an end to this time by himself, only Yahweh could do that. The king now had his reason restored to him. And the first thing he did was lift his, high, his eyes to heaven. He now knew the principle that Spurgeon later explained. The God whom we serve not only exists, but reigns. Know the position would become, would become him, but that of unlimited sovereignty over all his creatures. And I have another quote by Spurgeon here. This return to reason results in worship. We do not worship enough, my brethren. Even in our public gatherings, we do not have enough worship. Or oh, worship the king. Bow your heads now. Bow your spirits rather, and adore him that liveth for ever and ever. Your thoughts, your emotions, these are better than bullocks and he goats to be offered on the altar. God will accept them, worship him with lowliest reverence, for we for you are nothing, and he is all in all. We're nearly there. We're still all awake. Just about. <laughs> You'll be surprising what you can see from up here. <laughs> when you see clearly that Yahweh can change the heart and mind of a man and a woman, we will see it in our prayer life. Yahweh is awesome and controls everything let that sink in and worship him all the time Nebuchadnezzar was restored back to his kingship the thing is Yahweh wanted to restore Nebuchadnezzar 
The goal wasn't to bring him low, but to bring him to his proper place before God and among men. Truly Nebuchadnezzar learned that those who walk in pride he is able to put down. And I'm sure you'll find many Christians who have got to their own low point in life before they've turned to Christ. I know I did. And I'm sure others have. James 4, 6 says this, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And finally, so remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar when he was so too proud of himself. Pride drives a wedge between yourself and Yahweh. And I'm sure you don't want that to happen, do you? Don't let pride rule your life. Being humble is the only way of Yahweh. And he wants you to be obedient and prosper. Amen. Just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. And we do thank you for the book of Daniel. So rich. We've got such a, a character in Nebuchadnezzar. But there, Daniel stands amongst his court and you work through Daniel you interpret the dreams that you give to Nebuchadnezzar and we've just seen how a proud powerful man can be brought to his knees so we thank you for the richness of your word in Jesus name Amen Thank you so much for watching to the end. If you like this video, please click the subscribe button to help this channel reach more people with the truth of the gospel. Thank you for your support and encouragement. God bless.